So as we start off a new section in this class looking at IPE or international political economy, we're going to introduce a couple new theories about how the international system works when we're focused on questions of economic growth and development. But it's worth revisiting the idea of theories as just a set of assumptions that help us to make sense of the world, right? And so a good theory, as you may recall, is parsimonious. It's simple, it's elegant, and it helps us to explain a lot. And ideally, we'll be able to use that explanation for prediction to figure out what's likely to happen and how things are going to work, but also for policy response, right? And so theories have implications for how to get outcomes that we want, what we should do, and what we should set up. And so today, as we talk about international political economy theories, particularly economic liberalism and economic nationalism, we'll also introduce sort of the policy prescriptions that oftentimes get associated with these theories. Okay, so let's start talking about the theory, the assumptions of economic liberalism. This is actually very similar to um, idealism or liberalism that we've talked about so far as sort of that Wilsonian idea of states cooperating and working together. And you'll see those threads sort of playing out through economic liberalism as we talk about this. So similarly to Wilsonian liberalism, um, economic liberalism says that economic life is really complex. There's a lot of different actors out there. There's individuals, there's firms, there's states, there's all these different actors, and they all play an important role in economic life, and we need to think about how they all work together. Although I would point out that economic liberalism tends to downplay the role of states as economic actors. It tends to see them as setting sort of the, the rules and the playing field and working out sort of the, the boundaries, but the real sort of economic activity is done by individuals and businesses that are working through a process of competition in a market system. Okay, so those states and firms and individuals are all competing against each other. In fact, economic liberalism really celebrates intense competition um, because intense competition should lead to um, actors maneuvering in a way that's gonna make things more efficient, which means there's more stuff being cranked out, which means there's more stuff to go around, which is a good outcome. In fact, economic liberalism suggests that competition should be good. It should produce a positive sum outcome. It should make it so that, that everything is better because of that competition. Um, and lastly, economic liberalism, again, downplays the role of power. It's a theory that is primarily about markets rather than a theory that's about power, um, and therefore we focus a lot less on uh, powerful states and how they can distort or shape markets because it's minimally important. And in fact, economic liberalism would say when states get involved in markets and distorting markets, um, that actually leads to, to less efficient outcomes. It gets in the way of that positive sum growth that comes from competition. And so we should expect states to naturally try and stay out of markets and let things work themselves out. Okay, so if that's how you think about international um, economics, then you might be inclined to follow a set of procedures and policies um, to try to maximize growth and, and, and economic output um, that really encourage competition and encourage markets. And so over the last couple decades, there's been a series of policies that have come to be known as the Washington Consensus. And these are our macroeconomic sort of big picture economic um, policies that have largely been embraced by the United States, um, by most um, intergovernmental organizations that deal with the economy, such as the World Bank or the IMF for the World Trade Organization, the European Union and other big donor states have also sort of joined together behind the set of policies. And so by and large, this is the, the policy prescription that tends to get associated with economic liberalism. So one of those is fiscal discipline, fiscal being sort of your budgets and your spending, the idea is that you want to run roughly balanced budgets or have deficits that are reasonably within the bounds of, of your state. You don't want to have massive deficits because that could potentially wreak havoc with all sorts of um, issues of monetary stability and stuff that we'll talk about next week when we talk about currency systems. Um, secondly, you want to help maintain those balanced budgets by making sure that whatever government spending you do have is focused on things that are going to yield an economic return. And so spending on education is generally viewed as acceptable. Spending on health care is generally viewed as acceptable. Keep your population alive, keep them healthy, um, prevent the spread of disease, all that's good for economic growth. Um, building infrastructure is generally okay. Um, defense spending and subsidies are usually viewed as detrimental. Defense spending contributes um, nothing necessarily productive for the economy in the long term. Any, any construction that's done for defense spending could be more profitably 
you know, shift it over to producing something that people are going to use in, in the um, consumer sense. Similarly, subsidies and other economic policies that where you spend money to gain economic advantage are going to be distorting to the economy and, and economic liberalism says, just don't even do that. You'll be better off without. You want low taxes um, is another part of economic liberalism. You want to create an environment that is relatively friendly for people to operate economically. So keep taxes low, um, particularly on businesses and industry. You want your money supply to be controlled by professionals and not by politicians. Again, we'll talk about currency policy at length next week, but it's worth uh, pointing out at this point that the fear is that if politicians control the money supply, they might just simply flip on a printing press and run cash and use that cash to do things that are popular, but at the end of the day end up really distorting and potentially collapsing the entire currency system of a state. And so the idea is that you get that power out of the hands of politicians who might be motivated by the upcoming election and into the hands of, well, usually economists who apparently are um, willing to manage for the greater good of the economy. Um, you want exchange rates to be driven by markets. Again, this is something we're going to talk about a lot when we talk about currency systems. Um, you want to open up your markets to trade and investment. So the idea is you want to maximize competition. You want to participate fully in a global economic system in which money is flowing in and going to invest in new industries and you're, you're competing through trade and finding your, your comparative advantage, which we'll talk about, and, and the ways to make your, your economy most efficient in a global trading system. You want to deregulate your economy, um, privatize national industries, you want to uh, reduce red tape, and you want to um, get as much of your industry in private sector hands rather than having government try to do crazy things like run a flour mill or have a state bank, both of which are things that the state of North Dakota does um, that pointedly run counter to the Washington consensus. And then finally, you want to protect property rights. The idea is that you want people to invest, you want people to build up industries, and they're not going to do that if they worry that at any day, you know, the property rights system might be flipped upside down and, and land that you've invested in building factories on gets seized by the government. Um, so you want to ensure that, that investors have confidence in the property system. Okay, so these are policies that have been pushed pretty aggressively um, with the idea that they will maximize competition and tie states together into a global economic system. There's a different approach to thinking about the international economy, um, one that is much less optimistic about competition producing a positive outcome for everybody, one that's much more focused on um, I guess what we would say relative gains, right? And so economic nationalism is an approach to thinking about economic, um, to thinking about the global economy that aligns much closer to realism, right? And again, you can see that, right? States are the central economic actors. If you want to understand the global economy from an economic nationalist perspective, it's all a story about states and what states are doing and how they're using their power, both economic power and military power to improve their economic position, right? Um, and states are desperate to improve their economic position because your economic power is the foundation of your military power, having a steel industry, being able to feed your population, having the most cutting edge, te edge technology, all of that is gonna be foundational to having a competitive, effective military. And a competitive, effective military is something that you could conceivably use to advance your economic power, whether that's opening up markets for trade or whether that's ensuring that debts get paid. There's lots of examples throughout history of states using military power to advance their economic ends. Um, and all of this sort of focus on states and how they might manipulate the global economy really comes from a foundation of thinking about global competition between states as zero sum, right? One state is pulling ahead, gaining market share, gaining economic advantage, other states are falling behind. So it's a much more um, pessimistic view of, of global competition, and one that leads to a couple different ways of, of approaching things. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about mercantilism. Uh, mercantilism is talked about in the Goldstein Peep House book, um, and it's also a, a strain that's closely related to economic nationalism, but I think we've sort of moved away from it a little bit. Uh, mercantilism is this idea that was very popular around 1500, um, before we had sort of a, a well-developed understanding of, of economic systems, before Adam Smith wrote his, you know, um, foundational text, The Wealth of Nations. Um, and it begins with sort of a, a very zero-sum kind of thinking, right? Markets are fixed. 
there are a limited number of export markets. And so if you think about this from the perspective of, I guess, European colonists and settlers and explorers in 1500, um, they're going out into the world and they're discovering that there are all these cities along the coast. And there's sort of a scramble to get out into the world and establish trading posts in all these different cities. And the idea is that if you get to a city first, you negotiate a deal with the leadership of that city. Now you have control of, of the trade lanes into that city and that's an economic boon to you, right? And there's only so many cities on the coasts. And once they've been divided up, there's really no place for anybody to grow or to expand. And so it's really a, a fixed competition for those, those specific markets. On top of that, there's an idea that, you know, consumption by individuals is going to be fixed, right? And so if you're a cobbler and you're thinking about potential global consumption of shoes, you take roughly the number of people on the planet and multiply by two to get how many shoes people need. And that's that, right? You, you, in 1500, you're sort of imagining a world where maybe everybody's going to have one pair of shoes and that's it. Both of these assumptions are, are of, of, of limited export markets and a fixed consumption are, are really off base when we look long term. Um, we, we see that markets can grow. We see that consumption can expand, right? And so I personally have more than one pair of shoe. I have my sort of everyday shoes. I have my running shoes. I have my black dress shoes. I have my brown dress shoes. And then I have some schnazzy blue shoes that I wear when I'm feeling like I want to, you know, really stand out, right? So we can have more than one pair of shoe. And over time, consumption has, has certainly increased as societies have become wealthier. So this foundational assumption of fixed markets that comes with mercantilism is probably not accurate. But once you start with that assumption, it creates all sorts of different sort of um, implications for how you should proceed. Okay, so another piece of economic nationalism is that we think about economic strength in terms of capital, right? Um, money coming in. And so one of the things that you, you might notice about President Trump is that he's really fixated on um, trade deficits and how much you're, you're consuming um, relative to how much you're exporting. And that's an important thing from a mercantilist perspective, right? Because what you really need is a massive pile of cash or gold, I guess, in your treasury that you can do use to hire mercenaries, right? Capital and a big pile of gold is the foundation of military strength. And if you have capital, if you have gold, you can hire mercenaries, you can conquer more territory, you can open up more uh, markets, you can gain economic advantage, right? So making sure that you have more money coming in, that you're exporting more than you're importing is really important. Uh, if you can't do that, then you need to go and find a gold mine, right? And so one of the things that happens in the 1500s is that European powers are scrambling out to the rest of the world, trying as best they can to find gold mines that they can mine and ship gold back and use to fuel wars and build armadas and conduct foreign policy because in a mercantilist world, we really think about economic power as a vehicle to military power, and that vehicle is big piles of gold. Okay, so in a contemporary setting, we don't focus as much on big piles of gold. We don't focus as much on this idea that markets are fixed or that consumption is fixed. Instead, we focus um, that sort of zero-sum assumption in, in terms of policies that might help a state gain economic leverage or gain economic advantage, right? And so one of the ways that this has been implemented is through what's called export-led development. And so we've seen this used by a number of successful countries in Asia and the Pacific region, whether it's Japan or South Korea, Taiwan or China over the last, you know, 40, 50, 60 years, or before that, the United States, which pursued a very similar set of economic policies to gain um, economic uh, ground and to industrialize. Right. So the, the foundational piece is you begin by protecting domestic industries from global competition, right? So the idea is that global competition is going to blow your domestic industries out of the water. And so you throw up tariffs and barriers that make foreign goods more expensive. That creates space for your domestic industries to survive and thrive and grow and develop. On top of that, you're going to pick industries um, to support. So governments will identify a particular industry. And so if you're Japan in you know, 1950, the government says, we're going to become an automotive superpower. We're going to sell cars. And if you look at that from an economic perspective, you might say that's ridiculous. Japan is a terrible place to become an automotive superpower. They have almost no natural resources that you would need to develop 
an automobile industry. There's no steel, there's no um, coal or iron that you can, you can work with. And yet Japan does this because they throw the government weight behind that. And so there's all sorts of things you can do. You can give, you know, low interest or no interest loans. You can give subsidies to support these industries. Um, you do whatever you can, whether it's negotiating trade agreements to make sure that those industries become globally competitive and you build a huge export sector around those industries and that provides um, the capital and the fuel that's going to that's going to really drive the rest of your economy <clears throat> and governments can do all sorts of things to kind of help facilitate this whether it's you know making sure that you have access to raw materials so if you're japan and you don't have domestic iron and coal deposits the government's job is to make sure that iron and coal deposits are available to those industries at a very competitive price um, and that they've opened up markets where they can sell so the idea is that the, the, the tools of economic policy that we'll talk about and the um, will of the state is put behind specific industries to really fuel a process of industrialization. And it can work really well. 